And so I wanted to use this opportunity to let you know about four medication classes that I think should be on your radar, two of which I'm routinely prescribing to my patients in the clinic, and we're seeing some pretty awesome results. And then I want to talk about some skincare devices that have got the potential to uh, reverse the signs of skin aging. But first, I wanted to talk about two mistakes in the longevity field, and I wanted to share those mistakes with you so that we don't fall into the same traps. And that's why I've titled my talk, Stop Burning Your Capital, Here's How to Get Outsized Longevity Return on Your Investment. So the first involves a molecule from red wine. Uh, it's called resveratrol, and I'm sure many of you are aware of the story. Um, so resveratrol in the early 2000s, it was heralded as a longevity supplement, because if we start taking it, we were going to activate an enzyme called SIRT1, or sirtuin one and through that activation, we were going to see amazing health benefits. And that excitement was based on some single cell research, as well as a particularly famous mouse study. And Based on that excitement, GSK stepped in and they bought the rights to that research for $720 million. They spent a number of years later trying to replicate that research uh, in millions more of precious capital. And unfortunately, they could never get that um, line of research uh, replicated. They tried other ways to try and salvage that investment, but ultimately, it was a total loss. It's the same story with egg precursor cells. So the promise here was huge, that if we could use stem cells uh, and inject them into ovaries, maybe we could have treatments for infertility and even extend the window that a woman might be uh, fertile for. And on the back of that uh, initial science, Overscience was then founded in 2011. And again, this was based on some uh, initial exciting uh, findings in a lab. But despite many years of trying to get this technology to work, uh, eventually it, they, they couldn't replicate their initial findings. And again, they just couldn't get this technology to work. So this actually involved an investor lawsuit because the investors felt misled. And the CEO of this company had to settle with the SEC uh, for fraud charges. So after a couple of... Um, uh, yeah, um, after a couple of mergers and acquisitions later, this company totally collapsed. So the costs here are obviously significant. There's uh, investor losses, so your precious capital has been lost. But there's also credibility uh, costs to the longevity field. Um, so how many times have we seen you know, new headlines saying that we've found something amazing in a lab uh, and we're only moments away from being able to um, you know, massively extend health span or lifespan? So there's a clear pattern here. There's the exciting initial discovery, usually based on one particular lab. Uh, there's massive investment that then flows into that um, discovery, only for the realization years later that we were potentially misled by that initial discovery and we couldn't replicate those results. There's a better way to do this. And I want to give an analogy uh, with the SpaceX to, SpaceX's development of the Falcon 9 rocket. So bear with me on this one. Um, so they had the idea that they wanted to figure out a way to not only launch, but then land their rockets. And the implications here were huge. Um, if they could perfect this technology, then they could massively reduce their costs and increase their access to, uh, uh, to space. Now, from their initial testing, they had a strong suspicion that they were going to be on the right path. They were building from a solid foundation, again, based on those tests. So these failures that you're seeing on the screen here, they weren't only accepted, but they were expected. Because with every failure, they could learn, they could iterate, Rate, and then they could scale once they got this technology working. And I believe it was in 2015 they finally managed to get this technology working where they landed the rocket. And I think we need to take a similar approach with the longevity field. We have to make sure that we're building from a solid foundation of science, and then we can move forward and scale. So how can we do this? Well, one way is to focus on the interventions testing program. So the interventions testing program is run in the United States, and what they do is they test different molecules in mice to see whether they will extend uh, health span and lifespan. But what's special about this program is that they run the same experiment at the same time in three different labs. So we know that if we see a positive result here, it's most likely to be a true reproducible result. And again, we can build from that solid foundation of science. They also use genetically diverse mice. So in theory, at least, if we see a positive results here, it should translate uh, more effectively into humans rather than using other inbred strains of mice, um, in theory at least. So it solves the reproducibility crisis. And just to give another example about how critical this is, um, there were uh, 53, so if we have a look at, the, um, at cancer, for example, yes, there's been uh, progress with cancer treatments, but it hasn't been as explosive or um, as fundamental as what we had initially hoped. And one of the potential reasons for that is um, a lot of the initial science was based on 53 clinic, uh, key preclinical uh, studies. And so those studies that informed different cancer uh, targets, drugs, and then also moving on to um, human clinical trials. But when Amgen in 2000, 
2012 tried to replicate those 53 foundational studies. Only six of them were reproducible. So it's no wonder that this has been a bit of a house of cards that has fallen and collapsed. And again, that's why we haven't seen the explosive results that we were hoping for. The interventions testing program, however, it's got that reproducibility built in. It means that, again, we can build from that solid foundation of science. So here are some examples of successes where we've potentially saved your capital. So the first one is fisetin. So fisetin is a so-called senolytic agent. So when um, our cells grow and divide, they can only divide so many times until they become senescent. The trouble is that senescent cell can excrete a bunch of different factors that can damage the surrounding tissues. So senolytics are there to try and remove those senescent cells so that their damage doesn't happen, and then we can replace those senescent cells with fresh new ones uh, that, that aren't senescent. So again, when the interventions testing program trialed fisetin, there was no lifespan extension effect seen, and there were no other benefits seen. So to me, that says that we haven't quite nailed the senolytic uh, preclinical work yet. We need to go back to the drawing board and make sure that we know which senescent cells we need to remove and how best to do that, and then we can start to scale. The second example I want to give is uh, nicotinamide riboside. So many of you, I'm sure, have heard of nicotinamide riboside. It's an NAD precursor. So NAD is central to our metabolism, and through different stresses and even, even the aging process itself, our NAD levels can come under stress. So the hope is that by using precursors like nicotinamide riboside, we can support our NAD metabolism. But when the interventions testing program trialed nicotinamide riboside, there was no lifespan extension effect and there were no other benefits seen either. So again, to me, that indicates that we haven't quite nailed the preclinical work with our NAD metabolism. We need to figure out how best to support it. And if we skip ahead to the human clinical studies of you know, nicotinamide riboside or other um, precursors of uh, NAD, the results have been quite mixed and there's nothing really to, be, uh, to write home about. And again, it's because we haven't yet based um, those uh, clinical trials on that solid rock of preclinical work. So again, this is just one example to do it, but we can use the interventions testing program to validate interventions and ensure that we're basing human studies on robust, reproducible preclinical results. So what are some present opportunities? Um, what are some high upside interventions? Well, the first of four medication classes that I wanted to highlight to you today is SGLT2 inhibitors. So these are, um, this is one of the medications that I'm routinely prescribing to my patients in the clinic, uh, particularly for my type 2 diabetic patients. So it basically works by telling the kidneys to pee out glucose, to pee out sugar, and it's wonderful to help uh, control a patient's blood sugar levels. But what's really interesting about this class of medication is that it started to be repurposed for other interventions. So, for example, in heart failure patients, so these patients do not have type 2 diabetes, they've just got heart failure. When we give them SGLT2 inhibitors, we reduce the need for hospitalization and we reduce their cardiovascular disease death rate. And it's a similar story for kidney health. So for chronic kidney disease, uh, where the kidneys are leaking protein, and again, these patients do not have type 2 diabetes, when we give them SGLT2 inhibitors, their kidneys leak much less protein we reduce uh, the kidney decline over time and we reduce the chance that that patient will go into end-stage uh, chronic kidney disease and requiring dialysis. But what's quite interesting is that there is some preclinical work now to suggest that maybe SGLT2 inhibitors can also play a role in senescence, which is what I was talking about with fisetin. And it also helps to balance the post-feeding uh, glucose spikes that we get whenever we eat some food. So when the interventions testing program trials an SGLT2 inhibitor called canagliflozin, it extended male mice lifespan by 14%. So there's a solid rock of preclinical work here that we can build upon, and we, again, are starting to expand these interventions uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors, and it might be that based on this work, um, and this is an interesting hypothesis to test and potentially invest in, is whether we could use SGLT2 inhibitors at low doses in otherwise healthy individuals to extend our healthy lifespan and reduce kidney decline, etc. So, uh, again, I think this warrants your attention. The second class of medication uh, that I wanted to bring to your attention is rapamycin, which again, I'm sure many of you have heard. It's the golden child of the interventions testing program, because whenever they test it, it extends both male and female mice lifespan anywhere between 17 to 25%. But getting human clinical trials off the ground in otherwise healthy individuals with rapamycin until recently has been quite tricky, because there's been a lot of questions about dosing and how often we should be giving rapamycin. Because um, 
in clinical medicine, rapamycin is used as an immunosuppressant. So if you needed a kidney transplant, for example, one of the drugs that you'd be on is rapamycin to make sure that your own immune system doesn't attack that donated organ. So it's been um, quite challenging to get the medical community on board with this line of research. There has, however, been um, some clinical trials now showing that if we get the dose correct, we don't seem to have this immunosuppressive effect and we don't see an increase in infection rates. Um, so on the back of that safety data, again, Matt Cableine and I, we set up a clinical trial looking at rapamycin and combining it with exercise. And we, and we wanted to see what would happen um, with one group who took rapamycin and exercise and the other group who just exercised. And we were looking to see what happens to older adults in terms of their muscle strength and function. And I'm really pleased to share with you today that we've now got the results of that study and we've submitted it for peer review. Um, so if you did want to uh, learn about those results, um, with the caveat again that they are under peer review still, please find me after this talk because the results I think give us a really interesting direction about where we should be taking rapamycin for otherwise healthy individuals. Uh, the third of four medication classes I wanted to bring to your attention is GLP-1 medications, which again, I'm sure many of you have heard about already. Um, so this is a class of medication I'm routinely prescribing to my patients for their type 2 diabetes, but because of how it works, it also results in significant weight loss. So it's been repurposed as a weight loss medication. Um, and we also seem to get other metabolic health benefits as well. So much like the SGLT2 inhibitors, it started to be repurposed for other indications such as sleep apnea. There's also heart failure trials that have been very successful uh, and also kidney health as well. Um, but it may have broader longevity benefits. So that, and again, this is an interesting hypothesis to test about whether microdosing GLP-1 medications for otherwise healthy individuals would also offer us also offer us um, health benefits in terms of you know, helping to um, reduce the, the chance that we would go on to developing uh, you know, diabetes and even potentially extending our healthy lifespan. Again, it's a really interesting um, hypothesis to test, and that's based on a solid rock of foundational science especially when we consider um, combining GLP-1 medications with other peptides. So GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide 1. We've also got um, GIPs, which are gastric inhibitory polypeptides, and that's exactly what tazepatide is. So tazepatide, in the clinical trials that we've got at the moment, offers greater weight loss compared to just GLP-1 medications. Retitrutide takes that one step further, and it's got three different uh, classes of uh, peptides in it. And in a phase two study, that's offered even further weight loss effects compared to tazepatide. So this area is ripe for innovation, um, and again, I think it warrants your attention. The final class of medication is PCSK9 inhibitors. So these are medications that work by lowering your LDL cholesterol levels, but they've got the potential to completely revolutionize how we treat and prevent cardiovascular disease. So they basically work by telling the liver to express lots of LDL receptors. And so um, if the liver is expressing lots of those receptors, it pulls the LDL particles out of our blood uh, and where the cholesterol can then be processed in the liver rather than the, than the cholesterol being dumped in the blood vessel walls. So we we already have PCSK9 inhibitors, but what's really interesting now is we've got small interfering PCSK9 inhibitors. So these are medications where, where you give the medication once, at the six month mark, your LDL cholesterol levels are roughly 50% lower compared to what they were at baseline. Now that's important because yes, I can prescribe a medication in the clinic, but life gets in the way sometimes for patients. They fall off the bandwagon and uh, they stop taking these medications. Whereas if we only have to use these types of medications every, uh, you know, twice a year, that massively increases adherence and has got the potential to massively reduce cardiovascular disease as well. But if we're not too interested in medications, there is um, the potential for uh, reversal of the signs of skin aging. So these are devices that stimulate the body's natural repair mechanisms. And this area is exploding in popularity because of some recent um, innovations. So. We used, to just, we used to just have ablative options. So ablative uh, skin lasers, they would essentially burn the top layer of your skin and then stimulate the deeper layers of your skin uh, to repair themselves. And while they offer fantastic results in terms of uh, reducing fine lines and wrinkles, there's significant recovery time, as I'm sure you can imagine. Now, however, we've got non-ablative uh, devices, which offer almost as good a result in terms of reducing fine lines and wrinkles, um, but without that significant uh, recovery time. There's also other emerging areas like LED devices, uh, red light therapies, which um, we're very 
we've already experienced here at the conference. We've also got um, IPL lasers, uh, so intense pulsed light. So those are devices that are fantastic at treating uh, freckles and age spots. So these are options that I actually personally use and I also recommend to my patients as well because they are completely revolutionizing how we can uh, reverse the science of skin aging. So what's the overall lesson here? What am I trying to impart to you today? So the old model was to bet big on an early result, but the new model is to, is to first validate that initial result rather than jumping ahead first. So we want to make sure that, again, we're building on that solid rock of foundational science that is reproducible so that we're not falling into those same traps. Then we can iterate and then we can scale. So make sure that we avoid the hype traps and we can invest in validated interventions and make sure that we're giving your capital the love and attention that it deserves. And if you did want to find me after this talk uh, to talk about the rapamycin clinical study, I'll be more than happy to answer your questions. But thank you very much.